the poet not in attendance. The next great American novel won't be started on a cocktail napkin, but all us artists and addicts, we just refuse to quit trying. He's got this way about him that makes it easy to ignore his flaws. For now, I'm just basking in the glow of all these warning signs. He sends 2 a.m. excuses that reek of drink. They spit gin fumes from my cell phone screen, and I spend too much time wandering around Manhattan listening to the same song on repeat and thinking about him. The sky must have shattered during my commute from Brooklyn, and the rain was waiting for me outside Grand Central Station. I asked him if he would spend the night. I told him he could leave without eating breakfast, and I wouldn't mind. The rain said that he couldn't stay, but he would send the moon to take his place. He knows. It's not the same. All that woman ever does is swell the tides in me, leave me sweating through the evening in a fit of fever dream. The moon is a glowing neon announcement that I should be asleep. The rain nodded his head in agreement and offered at least to walk me to my appointment. I had made it for my thyroid, but by the time that I arrived, I was all wrapped up in other body parts, contemplating the consequences of my weak American heart, how this organ needs a break, a week away from its relentless beating over poets who are just the latest mess to leave a mark. My doctor kept asking me what was wrong, and I said, well, I'm trying to think of the next line, and she said, well, that's what you told me the last time. He should have kissed me while he had the chance. Sounds like a good start. Eh, sounds like a poor ending, like an open-ended question, like a milk carton photo of a poet gone missing. And then that evening, on a phone call with my father, he said, are you dating anyone? He never asks that sort of thing, but he had noticed a strange quality in the way that I was speaking. And I said, dating? No, but there have been a lot of long walks where I forget to notice that my knees hurt. There's been a decent amount of moonlight and a few decent men. I wrote a few decent lines. In the end, the next great American love poem won't be started on a cocktail napkin, but all of us hopeless romantics, we just refuse to quit trying. For Chris, I still see you sometimes. Well, I imagine I do. Denial, they call this. Grief, just another promise that this city couldn't keep. It was warm today. The air perfumed with that glorious in-between scent of snow, footprints, and cement. The trees hummed false promises of spring. It's blood orange season. I didn't see you today, but you were on my mind. It's been about 10 months since you died, and I still don't know how. No one would say. I found out on the day after your funeral on Facebook. Your roommate told me the family wishes to keep the circumstances surrounding his death private. You were the first friend that I ever made in New York, the first lesson I learned the ingredients for your birthday cake were on my kitchen table, still in the bag with the receipts. I left them there for two days. I let the butter spoil. The last of your words that I can recall were, you look lovely as always, and I'm grateful that on the few occasions I saw you, I took the opportunity twice to say, the world needs more doctors like you, since you were headed for medical school until you left us. I guess twice wasn't enough, and I guess this is what it means to grieve and almost to ask, am I allowed to miss you like I do? I'd been reminding myself in the days leading up to your party not to drink too much for fear that I might kiss you. That day I went into work and the chef told me when I was 22 I have friend, he shoot himself in the head with a gun. And I cried into the dish sink. Yesterday, I finally made the cake. The recipe I wrote for you, I gave it to three men. I gave no explanation, save to say, it's blood orange season. And this was for him. Thank you. Wow.